get on you any day, Mr. Davis. Want to note, we are holding this hearing in compliance with the regulations for committee proceedings pursuant to House Resolution 8. At this time, I ask unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any point and that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and have any written statements be made part of the record. I hear no objections from my friends. It is, it is so ordered. We are here today, ladies and gentlemen, to continue examining the damage done to American democracy by election-related misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation, also known as MDM. This committee has been shining a spotlight on the threat posed by MDM since even before the 2020 election and continues to do so, holding roundtables and hearings and moving legislation to combat the falsehood spread about, spread about our electoral process. Just this year, the subcommittee has held a roundtable focusing on the impact of election-related MDM on the Spanish-speaking and Latino communities and a hearing on the impact of election-related MDM on communities of color. This Congress, the House has passed the For the People Act and Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act. Uh, each measure contained provisions to combat the spread of misinformation and disinformation in our elections. While mis- and disinformation came to the forefront of election-related issues during the 2016 and 18 election cycles, mis- and disinformation spread at unprecedented levels during the 2020 election, and unfortunately, it continues to spread today. Following the 2020 election, we saw the rise and perpetuation of what has been referred to as the big lie, a sustained effort to deceive millions of Americans with knowingly false claims of election fraud. This attack on our democracy continues unabated. Indeed, there is every indication that these attacks will persist through the 2020 election cycle. The proliferation of election-related MDM is a threat. It is a threat to every voter's free, fair, and equitable access to the ballot and is actively undermining the belief that our elections are fair and secure. Falsehoods spread about routine election processes such as mail-in voting and drop boxes and how votes are processed and counted and even more have led to threats to election officials, the, the January 6 attack on the peaceful transition of power, and have galvanized a wave of restricted voting laws enacted all across the country in the wake of the 2020 election. As we heard in detail during the subcommittee's April hearing, the mis- and disinformation targeted at communities of color and communities that speak languages other than English during the 2020 election continues at alarming rates. During today's hearing, we will examine the damage MDM has caused to our democracy, including the threats and the burdens experienced by election officials, its impact on election administration and election laws, and the undermining of public confidence in American democracy. We will also further evaluate the damage, the damage MDM is causing to communities of color. Concerningly, this is a national problem which merits national solutions. In 2021, states across the country enacted laws that restrict access to the ballot, many of which were passed under the guise of protecting against voter fraud, fraud that experts have said time and time again simply does not exist. This year, according to a recent analysis of the Brennan Center for Justice, we are starting to see election interference laws emerging in the states, laws that could lead to interference with how elections are run and how results are determined. Put simply, these laws undermine our democracy. Additionally, our election system does not function without the election officials, the administrators, and poll workers who work tirelessly to ensure our elections are carried out successfully. Unfortunately, the spread of false information about elections has made the job of election officials more difficult and, yes, more dangerous. America is in the middle of another election cycle, and experts have warned us, they have warned that the onslaught of mis- and disinformation will continue and become more widespread as we approach the November general elections. 
And so as we consider how best to combat disinformation, it is critically important. We hear from experts, experts and elections officials about the unique challenges posed by, prolifer by the proliferation of MDM. And so I look forward to hearing from the witnesses joining us today and learning more about the spread of MDM, how it has damaged our democracy and what we, what we can do to combat it. And so with that said, I want to thank you for listening. I will now recognize both the ranking member of the full committee and the ranking member of the subcommittee, starting with the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Stile. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We're here today on our third hearing on misinformation and disinformation. And I still don't think the American people are struggling to understand that not everything you read on the internet is true and that politicians sometimes are known to lie. Three of my favorites, where we hear them all the time, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Inflation is transitory. And a personal favorite, I was appointed to the Naval Academy in 1965. But we got a crisis on inflation, we got a crisis on the border, we have a crisis in crime, yet here we are again having a third hearing on misinformation and disinformation. You'd almost think that elections aren't breaking in favor of Democrats nationally. Statements like I read, they're wrong. But they don't demand government intervention. The government should not be the police of speech. I believe the American people are capable of forming their own opinions. It's actually why the First Amendment guaranteed that the government would not intervene. Our founding fathers believed that Americans had the right to debate ideas freely and then form their own, in, own opinions and exercise their right to vote. But let's talk about the disinformation campaign coming from the Biden administration. As I pointed out before, President Biden and Vice President Harris have continually spread misinformation. They continue to falsely accuse Republican-led states that have passed common sense election integrity laws of suppressing the vote, all in an attempt, all in an attempt to push forward their partisan legislations like H.R. 1. President Biden was even called out by the Washington Post for his claims about the new Georgia election law. But his claims weren't only proven false. When we saw record turnout, later in Georgia in the primary of 2022. Last week, as the Select Committee on the Economy, of which I'm a ranking member, we held our first hearing at the U.S.-Mexico border in McAllen, Texas, Democrats and Republicans. However, the, Repub the Democrats called the hearing not to discuss the border crisis, but instead to talk about infrastructure and green energy. Apparently and continually, many on the left want to ignore the crises that our country is facing because it doesn't fit their narrative. I was in McAllen, Texas, as I was saying, the 34th district, right next to the 34th district, which is 85% Hispanic in population, where Republican Myra Flores won an election. She's the first Mexican-born woman to serve in Congress. She's also the first Republican elected to represent this area of the Rio Grande Valley in more than 150 years. And if you're listening to past committee hearings, You'd listen and you'd hear the outgoing majority would have you try to believe that the only reason for the loss is because Hispanic voters are being targeted with disinformation. But it couldn't be further from the truth. Representative Flores focused on two key issues important to her community. The issue of record high inflation and the out of control border crisis. Is it disinformation to point out that the country is facing the worst inflation environment in 40 years? or that last month 200, 240,000 individuals were apprehended illegally crossing the United States-Mexico border? Who knew that voters in Texas didn't like paying $5 a gallon for gas or having to deal with record illegal immigration? It's almost like it doesn't matter if you're from James, Wisconsin or McAllen, Texas, or vacationing in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. People want to be able to afford gas, their groceries. People want to have a safe community for themselves and their families. So instead of attacking key voter integrity provisions and undermining trust, we should instead be working to restore faith in our elections. The American people will continue to see through the misinformation of this administration, as we have seen in Texas and in Georgia. The truth will continue to prevail, and our republic will continue to endure as long as we empower the American people and keep the government 
out of the business of policing speech. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back, and I thank the gentleman. This time, the chair recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Davis. Well, Mr. Chairman, and to my fellow committee members and witnesses, thank you for being here today. I enjoy being back in this committee room, and uh, this, is, this is a very good sign to be able to debate the issues that are most important to our country right now. But I'd like to briefly echo ranking member Stiles that the answer to misinformation is not for the government to police speech. Political speech is protected speech, even when you don't agree with its message. Yet too many on the left are dangerously close to implementing a socialist-style ministry of truth in attempts to silence their political opponents. As Mr. Lakowski notes in his written testimony, quote, popular opinions and powerful groups do not need the First Amendment to protect them. It is the unpopular thoughts and the historically marginalized groups that need the protection of the law, unquote. In fact, heavy-handed control at the expense of an unpopular narrative is exactly what we saw from Speaker Nancy Pelosi in the House. She didn't want conservatives like my colleagues Jim Jordan and Jim Banks serving on the January 6th Select Committee and asked tough questions that this committee should be asking about the security failures that day. So in an unprecedented move, she made sure no member appointed by the opposition party, myself included, could serve on the committee, all in an attempt to silence her political opponents. Now we're seeing the result of spe the speaker's actions play out on national TV. These Hollywood productions that are costing taxpayers millions are a one-sided narrative solely meant to attack President Trump and anyone affiliated with him. I mean, come on. Talking about an attempt to influence elections? They're so desperate to paint a certain narrative that they're spreading half-truths and outright lies, including by altering evidence. For example, they're sharing falsehoods about a member of our full committee, Mr. Barry Loudermilk, trying to insinuate that somehow meeting with constituents and friends of constituents from his home state, one of a member's most official duties, and taking them to the house gift shop and showing the children the Rayburn train is, is somehow a reconnaissance tour, a falsehood that the Capitol Police debunked, saying nothing about it was suspicious. But the truth doesn't fit their narrative. So the, those on the left now, they call our brave men and women in the Capitol Police liars. And just last Thursday, Democrat staffers snuck producers for the Stephen Colbert show into the House office buildings. Mind you, the very same buildings Mr. Loudermilk was falsely accused of taking people on a reconnaissance tour of. After being asked to leave but defying Capitol Police orders by coming back later, a move again facilitated by Democrat staffers. The Colbert producers caused such a disturbance banging on the doors of Republicans that Capitol Police arrested them well after hours. And we can't forget the 1-6 committee was caught doctoring text messages of Mr. Jordan. What other evidence have they altered? So if we're going to talk about misinformation and straight up lies that are spread in an attempt to influence voters, let's start with the political circus that is also known as the 1-6 committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back and I thank you for your opening statement. All right. In just a moment, I will introduce today's witnesses. But before I do so, as a reminder to our witnesses, each of you will be recognized for five minutes. Please be sure you can see the timer in front of you or on your screen and are mindful of the five-minute time limit. Your entire written statements will be made part of the record, and the record will remain open for at least five days for additional materials to be submitted. Uh, I want to welcome uh, each of our witnesses today. Uh, joining us today is author and journalist Mike Rothschild. Uh, also next to him is Joseph uh, Getachew, and I know I butchered that and I am so sorry, uh, but he is from uh, Common Cause, an organization that we're all very familiar with. Uh, Edgardo uh, Cortez of the Brennan Center for Justice, uh, Chairwoman Lisa Dealey of the Philadelphia City Commission, and finally Gary Lokowski of the Institute for Free Speech. 
Uh, Mr. Rothschild is a journalist focused on the intersections between Internet culture and politics as seen through the lens of conspiracy theorists. He has specialized in an investigation of the QAnon conspiracy theory since its inception in 2018. He is a leading commentator on the subject for many outlets and is the author of The Storm is Upon Us, a book about QAnon. Uh, the next witness serves as the Media and Democracy Program Director at Common Cause, where he leads strategic campaigns to educate and engage the public and policymakers on critical reforms needed to advance an open and, and accessible media ecosystem. Uh, our next witness is an advisor to the election security team at the Brennan Center for Justice, where he consults on the development of regulation, legislation, and litigation. Uh, he previously served as Virginia's first commissioner of elections, as chairman of the board of, uh, of the board for the Electronic Registration Information Center, and as chairman of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission Commission Standards Board. Uh, the next witness is Chairwoman uh, Ms. Dealey is the chairwoman of the Philadelphia City Commission, a bipartisan board of elected officials in charge of elections and voter registration for the great city of Philadelphia. Commissioner Dealey was first sworn in as city commissioner in January of 2016 and was elected chairwoman by her fellow commissioners in 2017. And last but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Lakowski is a pro bono senior fellow with the Institute for Free Speech and Counsel at Dillon Law Group. Uh, his current practice focuses on political law, election law, administrative law, appellate work, and nonprofit issues. Uh, I'm now going to recognize each one of these witnesses in the order in which I just introduced them for five minutes. Mr. Rothschild, you should go first, sir. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak on the danger of disinformation in American elections. Presidential elections have always spawned conspiracy theories, from whispers in pamphlets that Thomas, Thomas Jefferson was elected by an Illuminati plot, to viral tweets about Russia changing votes from Hillary Clinton to Donald Trump. But the 2020 election and its aftermath have seen disinformation not just employed by candidates or printed in crank books, but weaponized to cast doubt on the validity of elections themselves. What's come to be known as the big lie has led millions of Americans down a rabbit hole of distrust where they are told over and over that their vote will be stolen, that fraud is everywhere, and that a powerful cabal controls it all. The American electoral infrastructure is at a crisis point because of the endless lies, conspiracy theories, and bizarre claims voters are being fed. The seeds of the big lie were planted well before the voting itself. They included conspiracy theories about the safety of mail-in voting, fake mailers and fraudulent robocalls targeted at communities of color, and a year of drops by the mysterious conspiracy avatar QAnon offering a mind-boggling array of ways that the cabal would steal the election. And the churn didn't stop once the voting did. Every news cycle seemed to bring a new and more hyperbolic type of fraud. There were suitcases and cargo trucks full of fake votes, mules mailing large numbers of illegal ballots, mass electronic vote switching by Dominion voting systems, foreign intelligence plots, and countless others, spawning a lucrative industry of books, conferences, and films pushing these lies as if they were the truth. And for many Americans, they became the truth. One Axios poll found that 40% of Americans have doubts about the legitimacy of Biden's win while multiple polls by the Washington Post found that as many as 80% of Republicans believe that Biden won due to fraud and might not be the legitimate president. And two-thirds of Republicans have said they will not trust the results of the 2024 election if the Republican candidate doesn't win, according to an NPR poll. In particular, these lies were everywhere on social media. There were nearly 45 million tweets pushing hundreds of conspiracy theories sent just in the last four months of 2020 with social media platforms making little effort to crack down on the super spreaders of these hoaxes. Election disinformation has driven death threats and harassment of officials and poll workers. It's become mixed up with medical misinformation and quack cures for COVID-19. And it was a principal factor in the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. Many rioters truly believed that Biden had stolen the election, the proof was obvious, and Mike Pence had the power to deliver Trump's final victory. None of this was ever true. But disinformation isn't just about polling percentages or raw numbers of tweets. It's about distrust of authority 
and the feeling like your political opponents aren't simply wrong, but minions of Satan who must be stopped at any cost, including violence. And increasingly, the promoters of these lies are looking not to 2020, but to 2022 and beyond. Hundreds of new laws allowing citizens to carry out sham audits and recounts have now been introduced in almost every state. Gubernatorial and Secretary of State candidates, many of whom are openly aligned with QAnon, have proclaimed that they would not have certified Joe Biden's win or would throw out future election results if they personally don't believe they were conducted fairly, even if there is no evidence of fraud. These candidates could usher in a future where a small cadre of conspiracy theorists deputizes itself, not the people, to choose our leaders. And that crisis might already be here. Otero County, New Mexico's all Republican three member voting commission refused to certify the county's 2022 Republican primary results due to baseless conspiracy theories about Dominion machines changing votes to the point where the state's Supreme Court had to order them to do so. To be clear, conspiracy theories and disinformation are a human problem. Any of us can be pulled in by the right piece of disinfo hitting us at the right time in the right way if it aligns with something we already believe. Who among us hasn't hit forward on a social media post we agreed with and didn't fully read, only to find out later it was fake? But disinformation isn't just a fake viral tweet. It's a grave danger to our democratic process. And if government, private industry, and the American electorate don't agree to address the danger it represents, it could send America down a dark path that will be very difficult to come back from. Thank you again, and I yield the remainder of my time. And we thank you for your testimony. This time, the chair recognizes Mr. Getachew for five minutes. Chairman Butterfield, Ranking Member Style, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today at this important hearing. My name is Yosef Getacho, and I am the Media and Democracy Program Director at Common Cause, a national nonpartisan organization with more than 1.5 million supporters in 30 state chapters working for an open and accountable democracy. One of the core values of our democracy is the freedom to have a say in the people and policies that will determine the future of our nation and our communities. This is shaped by the freedom to vote, regardless of your race, ethnicity, gender, or income level. But in recent years, a small faction of individuals have grown increasingly skilled at spreading lies about our elections, <coughs> lies that targeted and continue to target black communities and other communities of color to suppress their votes. Lies that fueled a deadly attack last January on the very capital we sit in today, and lies that undermine public confidence in future elections and our civic institutions. This intentional use of false information designed to disrupt our democracy is known as election disinformation. Last October, Common Cause released a comprehensive report which explained the problem of election disinformation and proposed common sense, legislative, regulatory, and corporate accountability solutions to reduce its negative impacts on our democracy. Today, I want to focus on three key harms that disinformation has caused to our democracy as detailed in our report. First, disinformation has suppressed our right to vote. Disinformation agents are seeking to keep voters from casting their ballot by spreading content designed to confuse voters about the time, place, and manner of how to vote, intimidate or harass them from going to the polls, or creating false narratives about the integrity of our elections. We have witnessed a significant increase each year in the variety and volume of voter suppression content online. Election disinformation has particularly targeted black voters and other voters of color seeking to, to disenfranchise these communities. For example, disinformation agents targeted black and Latino voters during the 2016 election with fake ads falsely claiming that you could text your vote for Hillary Clinton. The spread of election disinformation has also been used as justification for the enactment of new voter suppression laws in states throughout the nation. According to analysis done by the Brennan Center, 19 states passed 34 anti-voter laws last year that make it more difficult for Americans to vote. Many of these laws disproportionately impact black, Latino, and Asian voters, including stricter voter ID laws, longer lines at the polls, and language access barriers. Second, disinformation has sowed distrust in our civic institutions and elections. The big lie, the false narrative that the 2020 presidential election was stolen from former President Trump has fueled significant distrust in our civic process. Surveys show that more than one in three U.S. residents and nearly 80% of Republicans wrongly believe that President Joe Biden did not legitimately win the 2020 election. The big lie has had several carryover effects ranging from election deniers running for election administration positions to impacting the 2022 midterm elections. 
Today, candidates are using the big lie as a platform plank to preemptively declare voter fraud in order to dispute the results of the 2022 election. Third, online disinformation has transitioned to offline harm, inciting violence, threats, and harassment. The January 6th insurrection was a catastrophic reminder of the fragility of our democracy. But this did not happen in a vacuum. The insurrection was fueled by the Stop the Seal movement, which was primarily organized, mobilized, and amplified through major social media platforms. The lies that led up to the violence on January 6th have not vanished. Rather, they are being used today to attack, threaten, or otherwise harass election workers. In my remaining time, I want to focus on reforms we must implement to combat election disinformation. There is no one solution to this problem. Rather, we need a comprehensive set of legislative, regulatory, or corporate accountability reforms to reduce the harmful impacts of disinformation. Many of these reforms involve reining in social media platforms whose business practices have incentivized the proliferation of harmful content. Key congressional reforms include comprehensive privacy legislation, protecting researcher access to social media data, and supporting local journalism. Federal agencies of jurisdiction must also use their existing authorities to combat election disinformation. Finally, agencies of jurisdiction must also use their existing, finally, social media companies must take greater steps to reduce the spread of content designed to undermine our democracy. In May, Common Calls and more than 120 organizations sent a letter to the CEOs of major social media companies urging them to take a series of actions to combat election disinformation ahead of the midterm elections. The time to act is now. Bad actors have flooded the zone with content designed to undermine our democracy. We cannot afford to wait any longer to put critical reforms in place to reduce the spread of harmful content. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I look forward to answering your questions. And we thank you for your testimony. This time, the chair recognizes Mr. Cortez virtually for five minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Edgardo Cortez. I'm an election security advisor for the Brennan Center for Justice. I've had the privilege of working at the local, state, and federal level in election administration uh, during my 20-year career. Uh, disinformation is having a profound impact on our democracy and making it increasingly difficult to administer free, fair, and accurate elections. Retaining and recruiting election officials and election workers is a challenge because of the election lies being promoted since 2020. Not only has disinformation led to increased threats against officials and called into question their ability to properly run elections, but it has also served as the pretext for anti-voter legislation that is designed to make election sabotage easier in the future. Election officials across the country broadly agree that lies about the election process have had a significant impact on their ability to do their job. In a nationwide survey of local election officials commissioned by the Brennan Center, nearly two thirds of officials said that the spread of false information about elections has made their job as an election official more dangerous. This information has fueled a wave of threats, harassment and intimidation directed toward election workers. In the Brennan Center survey, one in six election officials said they have experienced threats because of their job, and 77% said these threats have increased in recent years. More than one in four election officials are concerned about being assaulted on the job, and over half are concerned about the safety of their colleagues. The challenges created by election disinformation are making it more difficult for election offices to find the help they need. Nearly a third of election officials surveyed new election workers who left because of fear for their safety. In the long term, 60% of officials are concerned that threats, harassment, and intimidation will make it difficult to retain and recruit election workers. And many election officials themselves are leaving the profession. Although election officials broadly find enjoyment in their jobs and are proud of the service they perform for their community, Nearly 20% of officials surveyed plan to leave their positions before the 2024 election. For these officials, the number one reason cited for leaving was political leaders' attack on a system they know is fair and honest. As these officials depart, they are taking years or even decades of expertise and experience with them. While the substance of election disinformation is largely focused on what happened in the last election, the problems it causes have serious implications for future election administration. Although election workers have been the most directly affected, the consequences of making their jobs more difficult and dangerous is not limited to them. Voters, and ultimately our democracy itself, will be left bearing the burden. 
We are already getting a glimpse of what could happen if election offices and polling places are filled with people who are sympathetic to election conspiracies. Since the 2020 election, there have been at least 17 reported incidents where supporters of the big lie have gained or attempted to gain access to voting equipment to find evidence of false election claims. These incidents were often in coordination with or at the behest of some of the most prominent purveyors of election disinformation. In addition to the difficulties of dealing with these insider threats, election disinformation is being used as a pretext for passing anti-voter legislation in many states. Much of this legislation not only seeks to reduce access for voters, especially for voters of colors and those with disabilities, but also facilitates future efforts at election sabotage. Some of these efforts will make it easier for partisan actors to undermine the will of the people in future elections to achieve a desired outcome regardless of the actual votes cast. The Brennan Center's analysis found that the overwhelming majority of restrictive voting and election subversion bills introduced in 2021 were related to conspiracy theories related to the 2020 election. As a final point, uh, Congress should provide more funding to help state and local election officials protect the safety of their staff, and strengthen election infrastructure against insider threats from workers who have bought into election conspiracies. The Brennan Center estimates that these efforts could cost over $300 million nationwide. That's on top of already identified needs for cybersecurity and other steps to keep our elections safe, which run in the billions of dollars. Now, thank you for your attention to this important issue today. I look forward to your questions. And we thank you as well. This time, the chair recognizes Commissioner Dealey for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Butterfield, Ranking Member Style, and members of the Subcommittee on Elections. I am Commissioner Lisa Dealey, Chairwoman of the Philadelphia City Commissioners, the three-member bipartisan board responsible for voter registration and elections in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I am pleased to provide this testimony, and I have submitted my full written remarks for the record. First, I would like to point out that in the current term of Congress, the overwhelming majority of the members were on the ballot in November 2020. So when some of your colleagues choose to spread lies about that election, saying that it was stolen or that there was fraud, please make sure to remind them that it was their election too. It is remarkable that elected officials never seem willing to cast doubt on their own victory when transmitting lies about another's loss. I am glad this Congress is holding hearings to examine the serious problems of mis- and disinformation. In Philadelphia, our elections have been under attack by false claims for some time now. There is no doubt that you are familiar with some of the most famous instances of misinformation to come out of the city of brotherly love. Being in the middle of this mis- and disinformation around, tw around the 2020 election is really the most surreal experience that, I have, that has ever happened to me. I would sit there inside the Pennsylvania Convention Center where the counting of the mail ballots took place, looking at what was actually going on but then reading and seeing all this incorrect information being disseminated. It was like reading about an alternative dimension. Probably the most ridiculous story of the entire 2020 election was published by the Buffalo Chronicle. To sum up the story, Democratic operatives who were working in the department apparently provided crates of quote unquote raw ballots to a Philadelphia mobster. From there, according to the anonymous source, they were taken to South Philly and in 60 hours, 300,000 ballots were marked for Joe Biden. They were then packaged into nondescript cardboard boxes and dropped off outside the Pennsylvania Convention Center. For this, the mob was supposedly paid $3 million. But here's the kicker. The mobster was reportedly ready to flip on Joe Biden and provide primetime congressional testimony in exchange for a pardon from Donald Trump because he wants a clean record. He wants to fish and hunt on federal lands. He'd really like a job with the National Park Service. You need a clean record to get those things, quoted another anonymous confidant. It was so out there and was from a publication that nobody had ever heard of that originally my staff and I thought it was a joke story. Was this an Onion article? It was not until we started to get calls from established media outlets and fact-checking organizations that we realized that this was not a joke. Rudy Giuliani had mentioned it on Fox Business, calling it an allegation. It turns out the Buffalo Chronicle is, known dis is a known disinformation site run by Matthew Ricciarzi, a self-described pro-Trump political consultant in Western New York. 
The site had previously been investigated by the Toronto Star and Canadian Broadcasting Corporation for false stories relating to the 2019 election in Canada. The CDC sent a reporter to the address listed as their headquarters in Buffalo, New York, and almost stereotypically, it was an abandoned building. This type of mis- and disinformation has consequences for the security of elections and election officials. Conspiracy theories around our ballot counting prompted two men to drive from Virginia to Philadelphia with lock-picking tools, ammo, and guns, including an AR-15, the mass murderer's weapon of choice. Thanks to law enforcement, both were arrested. At one point, all three of the elected commissioners or their families were under some level of police protection. Therefore, security remains a big legacy for us. Our counting operations have since moved to our permanent bail processing center. The city is spending millions of dollars to upgrade the facility, adding fencing, bulletproof glass, and metal detectors. Since 2020, we have not held an election without hiring private security, which is expected to cost us $500,000 in the upcoming fiscal year. Also, before 2020, our operations were much more open and accessible to the public. Now we ask that the doors remain locked and that people call to be let into the building out of concern for our, sta our and our staff safety. I would like to conclude my testimony by saying there was no fraud, there was no steal. I and my fellow election professionals are human beings who take pride in running free and fair elections. Sometimes people lose elections because they get fewer votes. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. And we thank you as well. Uh, last but not least, the Chair recognizes Gary Lukowski for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. For my day job, I live in the Commonwealth of Virginia. When I want to come downtown, whether it's to testify before you, check out a Capitals game, or just take in the sights, I will usually hop in my car, drive down the interstate, and come into the city. Like many people, I think I'm a pretty good driver. Uh, I wish I could say the same for everyone else on the road around me, though. In spite of the beautiful views of the city, the monuments crossing the river, going up, going down the interstate, and driving through the city, it's rarely a pleasant experience. It seems no matter how fast I'm driving, there'll always be some maniac weaving in and out of traffic, blowing past me, or clogging up you know, the left-hand lane, plodding along, causing their own singular traffic jam. Disinformation is a bit like driving. We all think we're good at identifying what is true and what is not, and that the problem is everyone else. This is not a new feeling. During the 1800s, humorist Josh Billings reportedly said, it ain't ignorance that causes so much trouble, it's folks knowing so much that ain't so. Whether we call it disinformation, misinformation, or just people knowing so much that it's not so, the concern is not new. The reality, though, is that we should approach the problem with a healthy dose of humility. Just as it may turn out that we are the maniac on the highway, it may well turn out that we are also the ones who know so much that just isn't so. A commitment to a free and open discourse is imperative because it allows for the airing of dissent and the correction of errors. This is important because as we've seen time and time again, the widely believed narrative may well be wrong. As the maxim goes, to err is human, but to paraphrase the prayer of St. Francis, where there's error, may we bring truth. And that can only happen when dissenting voices are tolerated and not stifled as purported disinformation. Lies, untruths, things that just ain't so, whatever we choose to call them, they're bad. But the fundamental problem with regulating disinformation is who decides. Our Constitution is not neutral on this question. The text of the First Amendment reads in part that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. As a result, to quote Justice Kennedy, joined by the Chief Justice and those conservative paragons, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Sotomayor, absent those few categories where the law allows content-based regulations of speech is any general exception to the First Amendment for false statements. There is much ink spilled about the dangers to democracy from disinformation. However, there's comparatively little contemporary discussion about how regulating disinformation would itself be antithetical to our democratic ideals. Our Constitution begins with a simple yet revolutionary phrase, we the people. In the United States, sovereignty rests with the people, not a monarch, not a legislature, not some other autocratic ruler. As President Reagan said in his farewell to the nation, we the people tell the government what to do, it doesn't tell us. We, the people, are the driver, the government is the car, and we decide where it should go, by what route, and how fast. Government claiming for itself the authority to definitively tell the people what is true and what is not inverts this relationship. 
It transforms our federal authority from a servant of the people to its master. This, more than any malicious dis or misinformation, is a true existential threat to self-government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Now, the vast majority of government employees are dedicated, well-meaning people who want to do the right thing. But even well-meaning people can get it wrong. Moreover, even generally well-meaning people are still, at the end of the day, human. As Justice Stevens wrote in his dissent in United States v. Wells, the liberty of our citizens cannot rest at the whim of an individual who could have a grudge or perhaps just exercise bad judgment. Then there is the risk of bad conduct, specifically the risk that government officials or others will simply declare inconvenient, embarrassing, or incriminating information to be disinformation and seek to strangle valid criticisms in the crib. Finally, it betrays a deep lack of confidence in our own governing system to try to strangle ideas. As Justice Kennedy wrote, only a weak society needs government protection or intervention before it pursues to resolve its preserve the truth. Truth needs neither handcuffs nor a badge for its vindication. The solution today is the same as it's been for the better part of our national history. More speech, which allows true speech to outshine false statements in a marketplace of ideas. As distasteful as this may be at times, the alternative, positioning the government as an arbiter of truth, is far more dangerous to the health of our American republic. Thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss and debate these issues. I greatly appreciate your consideration and engagement. And thank you, Mr. Lukowski. All right, it's now time for questions. We will start on the Democratic side, and we will alternate until we finish. Uh, the chair recognizes Ms. Ledger Fernandez for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Butterfield. It's so critical that this committee continue, that we continue to expose how disinformation infiltrates and sows distrust in our democracy, how it endangers election workers. What more important thing could we do if we believe in democracy than to continue to do what is necessary to support that democracy? Disinformation. You know, the tias, the aunties back home would call it more directly, the lies, the mentiras told to keep us from voting. Those tias are referencing texts to voters that give wrong information about where and when to vote to intentionally make sure that those voters don't make it to the polls. And that electoral lies do have consequences. It's so very incredibly sad to see extreme Republican politicians refuse to acknowledge the harm caused by the electoral lies that Trump told, which we have learned in the January 6 hearings, Trump and his allies knew were false. Those tias back home, they call this sin veranza without shame. Do those who keep protecting those lies have no shame when they know that the lies led to a violent attack on the Capitol, an attack that led to the death of five officers and injury to 140 more? Lies that continue as noted that in my own state, the Otero County commissioners attempted to block certification of a Republican primary election with no evidence of any fault just repeating the lies regarding the Dominion machines. Mr. Uh, Getachow, uh, how can Congress help make sure that elected official, officials and others tasked with election certification certify the actual winners chosen by the voters? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. I think uh, Congress needs to look at a holistic approach to helping both voters make sure they have access to the ballot and election officials make sure that they have the resources they need to effectively administer the elections. In our report, we actually identified a number of solutions Congress can take to help voters. Um, one of those solutions is uh, voting rights reform. This committee has specifically um, looked at issues like HR1 and the For the People Act to make sure that voters <laughs> do have access to the ballot and that election uh, administrators do have uh, sufficient funding they need to carry out elections. Yeah, and this is just information. This isn't like a debate about policy. This is just making sure the voters are able to get to the right polls on the right days. Basic information, that's what we're talking about. It's not sort of engaging in the political discourse of which the voters need to decide who to vote for, but we want voters to get accurate information about when and where to vote and to not be intimidated about voting. 
Is that right? That's absolutely right. Uh, Commissioner Dealey, um, as an elections official, what do you think can be done to restore trust amongst voters and provide people with the help and confidence um, to identify disinformation so that when somebody sees that text come across, they say, uh-uh, somebody is trying to sell me the wrong information? Well, first, thank you. I, I believe that we need to start in our education system and instilling lessons in our young people so that they, they'll grow up to know the difference between what is true and what is false. Uh, as for now, I believe that we have to rely on elected officials and others to be truth tellers. So people look to, when elected officials speak, people listen. And we have a responsibility to speak truth and to fight back the disinformation. Thank you. Mr. Rothschild, you pointed out in your testimony that these lies uh, have not only proven to be durable, but are remarkable lucrative. Um, can you describe uh, how lucrative uh, the big lie is and for what organizations and entities? Well, I like to use the term stolen election industry because it is an industry. There are people who have made overnight careers out of peddling conspiracy theories, extremely complicated plots, and monetizing these things into books, into movies. There is a, a series of conferences that goes, around, goes on around the country almost once a month where uh, COVID disinformation peddlers stand next to uh, election deniers, everyone's selling merchandise, everyone's selling books, everyone's making money off of things that are not real that are being presented as real. Thank you. Um, uh, I did want to ask Mr. Cortez more information about how we, what can we do to protect our election workers, but I see my time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record a report from Equis entitled Latinos and a Crisis of Trust, a Landscape Analysis of Disinformation, Propaganda, and Hyperpartisan Narratives in Latino Spaces Online. As we've heard in our elections, there is a unique target of my Latino communities with this information that is false. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a mouthful, but I don't hear any objection, so without <laughs> objection, it will be received. Truly appreciate it. Thank you. At this time, the chair will recognize uh, the ranking member of the subcommittee for five minutes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I think one of the true challenges, one of the true challenges of disinformation, if you want to regulate it, is who decides? And I think that's one of the questions presented. So I'd like to, to do a quick round of questions for the in-person panel here as to who decides. First question, should news be pre-cleared for truth by the FCC or another government entity before it's broadcast uh, on the public airwaves? We'll go right down the line, Mr. Rothschild. Definitely not. Mr. Gittachow. No. Ms. Dealey? No. Ms. Lakowski? No. Thank you. Do you think that the federal government should have a disinformation governance board that coordinates with social media companies to review speech? Mr. Rothschild. Not a board, but I think there should be coordination. A, a role with the government and coordination. A role. Okay. Mr. Gettachow. Not a board, but the government does have existing authorities that they can use to combat disinformation. And you think they should? They have authorities to mitigate uh, harmful practices. Yes, sir. You think that's a good idea? I think they should use their authorities. Yes, sir. M Ms. Dealey? I think they should use the present authority that they have. Mr. Lukowski? No. No. If, Mr. if President Trump were still in office, would you want the federal government running a disinformation uh, governance board, or would it alter your opinion uh, to use the current government authority? Mr. Rothschild. I would not want the government doing that. Well, so you, you changed your opinion based on the administration? Is that accurate? No. No, I think that there should be a synergy between social media companies and between the government. I don't think one should rule over the other, but I think they should work in tandem. And you'd be fine with them working in the previous administration as much as this administration? For any administration. Okay, Mr. Gittachow. So government agencies have authorities regardless of who is in power in the administration. And so so the, the administration doesn't matter to you if it's the previous administration or this administration? Not when it comes to rulemaking, okay. enforcement, and Ms. investigations. Dealey? We should do what we have the tools in our toolbox to do. Okay. Ms. Rukowski? No. Okay. Should social media companies determine which posts are true and which ones are disinformation? Mr. Rothschild. Social media companies should enforce the rules that they have with transparency. But should they determine which posts are true 
and which are disinformation? I think that they can warn users on uh, known disinformation or lies. I'm going to take that more or less as a yes, Mr. Gettachow. Social media companies have civic integrity policies in place. Should they determine what's true and what's disinformation? When it comes to election disinformation, they are supposed to enforce their policies. That is right, but we're talking about private companies. Should they determine what's true and what's disinformation? When it yes, comes no to question. election disinformation, there isn't a uh, so, false No answer. Equivalent. Ms. Dealey. I think they should base their answers on factual information. So they should determine what's true and what's not. They have to get the facts from truth from telling. Well, they're getting it from somewhere, so you think they should make that determination, Mr. Lukowski? Social media companies are subject to the same temptations and fallibilities as anyone else. They should not be in the business of determining what's true and what's false. So here's one of the challenges that, that I see, and I, I've read, uh, Mr. Rothschild, I've read your testimony, I've read others. Um, and in your testimony, uh, you suggest several ways to combat misinformation, pre-bunking uh, conspiracy theories, social media stopping the spread of uh, myths and disinformation, employing trusted figures and communities uh, targeted by misinformation uh, to reassure people of the, quote, truth. Uh, and so I'd like to take that general concept and apply it to the Hunter Biden laptop story. So the New York Post released an article exposing a Hunter Biden laptop before the 2020 election. Almost immediately, social media companies banned the spreading of the article, citing quote, misinformation and trusted figures in the Democratic political apparatus who assured folks the story wasn't true. Yet after the 2020 election, it turns out that the information was true all along. It didn't fit the narrative the Democratic Party wanted before the presidential, before the presidential election. So Mr. Lakowski, here's the challenge. Who determines what's true and what's not true, and who should make that decision? I believe the American people should make that decision. I think when presented with all the information, they can choose for themselves, and I think that's the way it's supposed to work in a democratic society. And do you think it's, do you think it's opposed to democratic society to have a government regulator of the truth? Absolutely. The government's supposed to be the servant of the people. It's not supposed to be its master. It's supposed to take its direction from we the people, not direct we the people. I, I, I agree with you. I think there's real concerns where the government becomes an arbitrator of the truth. Uh, we see it, whether or not it's the Hunter Biden laptop story or any other conversation we're having here today, the American people are smart enough to learn and know and understand what's true and what's not true, regardless of what politicians are saying. And as I noted in my opening remarks, politicians lie, including the current administration. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the general lady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon. Five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Butterfield. You know, since 2016, at least, we've seen mis- and disinformation about American elections spread like wildfire, fueled by foreign adversaries and domestic political operatives alike. In the lead-up to and following the 2020 election, we saw the disgraced former president and his extremist political devotees embrace the use of disinformation as a tool to cling to power. Their abuse of political and judicial process with their corrosive lies have injected chaos and mistrust into our elections and led directly to the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. The issue here is not whether the government should police free speech, but whether political leaders have a responsibility to tell the truth. Instead of rebuking falsehoods about st stolen elections, many Republican leaders stood silent or embraced those lies for political gain. In the absence of a full-throated rebuke from the Republican Party, those lies festered, and we've seen dedicated public servants from both parties paying the price. Election officials and workers have seen an unprecedented spike in threats and violence as the former president and his allies have pushed lies about mail-in ballots, voting machines, and the results of the 2020 presidential election. In Pennsylvania, we saw individuals show up at the Philadelphia Convention Center with guns in an effort to intimidate vote counters. It must also be mentioned that these baseless allegations have exacted a heavy toll on the taxpayers. Counties and states have had to spend millions of dollars in security costs and legal fees to defend the accuracy of our elections and to protect the lives and personal safety of election officials and their families. One of my county officials had to defend over 30 baseless lawsuits brought against the county and him personally. These attacks on the integrity of our elections, including mail-in balloting, have made it more difficult for election workers to get out the vote and dispel concerns about voter security. So with this in mind, it's unsurprising that in recent polls, nearly 20% of election workers indicated that they plan to leave their jobs before the 2024 election. 
to ensure the continued success of American elections, it's incumbent upon every patriotic American, including our Republican colleagues, to stand up and confront lies about the very foundation of our democratic republic, our elections. So, Mr. Cortez, the Brennan Center has studied and reported on these growing threats and intimidation against election workers. The work you've done has been illuminating, and I want to thank you for that work. Can you discuss the connection between mis- and disinformation and the level of political unrest and violence we've seen lately? And I'd ask you to spend a little less than a minute, if you can. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, I, I think there's a there's a definitely a, a clear connection between uh, some of the lies being promoted uh, post-2020 and threats against election workers. Uh, the, the sort of threats and the vitriol uh, that, uh, you know, that, that have been targeted uh, at election officials is, is incredible. Uh, we now, you know, there's now a federal task force uh, that's been looking into these threats, uh, but we see the, the connection between uh, the sorts of things people are being told happened in the election uh, and the things that people are being threatened about uh, and, and about uh, certifying or not certifying elections. So there's definitely a direct connection there. Uh, that, that we have seen, uh, and it seems to be getting worse. Thank you. Um, yesterday, the bipartisan January 6th Select Committee heard testimony about the horrifying violence that and intimidation that election workers and public officials have faced as a result of the lies told about elections by the former president and his spineless allies. Um, Ms. Dealey, your testimony uh, referenced extraordinary precautions that you and your team had to take to protect yourselves from the violent fallout of misinformation. Can you talk a little bit more about that for the committee? Thank you, yes. We had to uh, move our mail ballot processing center to the Pennsylvania Convention Center, uh, where we had uh, security, both uh, private security uh, the city's police protection, as well as the sheriff's office, came and supplemented that. Uh, we had metal detectors. It was a scene that we've never seen uh, before in uh, elections in Philadelphia. In addition to that, myself and my other two commissioners, uh, or their fa and or their families, have both had uh, pol uh, police protection during that time. And I personally had a police detail with me um, throughout much of that time. Thank you. Um, I think I'll submit an additional question um, to Mr. Getachow about mal malinformation, um, because I think we heard some earlier about the tours of the Capitol. I was one of the 34 people who saw a tour and asked for further information, and as a result, had an ethics complaint filed against me simply for filing a request for more information, and I yield back. Davis, why don't you conclude? Well, you, then it would be my turn, and then we'll conclude. Well, all right. The misinformation continues. Capitol Police completely debunked the reconnaissance tour given by my colleague, Mr. Loudermilk, but it still seems to just progress with more and more misinformation coming from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who want to tell Americans what disinformation and misinformation is. So, Mr. Lakowski. I appreciate you being here today. Um, first question for you, can you elaborate on your statement that our Constitution embraces the idea that the remedy for bad or false speech is more speech that is true? Yes. So the theory behind that is simply put, because sometimes Tom Brady loses. In 2007, the Patriots went undefeated, went to the Super Bowl. Excuse me, sir, I'm a Raiders fan. <laughs> you want to talk about misinformation, disinformation, <laughs> bad calls, you bring up Tom Brady again. <laughs> the Patriots at the time were a juggernaut going into the Super Bowl. The conventional wisdom was that they would win that game hands down. But come Super Bowl Sunday, you play the game, and they lost. That's why the remedy for bad speech is good speech, because sometimes the conventional wisdom is wrong, and sometimes the unconventional wisdom is right. Well, I, folks on the left actually seem to be more afraid of, of they seem to be afraid of more speech because they then can't control the narrative to suit their progressive policies or can't fathom that the Capitol Police debunked something that no one has any evidence of seeing, even though we've seen the video, that they don't exist. But I would urge my colleagues who still believe in the misinformation 
of reconnaissance tours by Republicans on January 5th to go to the Capitol Police video. Go take a look at it. And I would love to be able to, to I would love to be able to debate this even later. Um, Mr. Rothschild, uh, when did the stolen election industry begin? I would say that the groundwork for it was laid in early 2020 with the uh, QAnon posts. It was the beginning of the, uh, the uh, laying the groundwork that the, that the election would be stolen, and the QAnon brand has been enormously monetized. So Governor Stacey Abrams, that didn't start back then? I don't know anything about that. Oh, I think you do. Stacey Abrams? Well, I know who Stacey she is, but I, I'm not familiar with the statements she's made. Some of the statements that the election was stolen made by former presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, so it conveniently didn't start back then, right? I would say that the industry around the 2020 election began in early 2020, but it's certainly natural for candidates that lose an election to grouse about it. I think most just don't take it to the extremes that we've seen now. Hmm. I, I kind of think former presidential candidate Clinton took it to some extremes. And I, I think Stacey Abrams, who was asked here at a hearing uh, not too long ago uh, whether or not she believes she won the election. Um, people on one side of the aisle take it to the extreme, unfortunately, but the other side of the aisle then does something extreme and they begin the process of this industry. I, I just find it hard to believe that it always happens to be to the benefit of one pol political party versus the other. In your testimony, you expressed concern with states creating new election laws, and you said that creating commissions or agencies tasked with overseeing elections where members could be appointed by partisan legislators and be given wide latitude on conducting audits or recounts could imperil legitimate election results in the process. You also state that mail voting is safe and secure. Quickly, what's your experience in administering an election? I don't have any. Have you ever been a poll worker or a poll watcher for an election? I have not. What role should citizens have in our elections process? Should they be able to have meetings, meaningful access to view election procedures? Definitely. Okay, can you describe what meaningful access is? I think there, there is a difference between a transparent process and filing bogus lawsuits and demanding forensic recounts of elections that have been settled and certified. Last election cycle, we saw some states mail live ballots to every voter in their on their unmaintained voter registration lists, even without the voter requesting a mail ballot. Do you support this practice? I think these lists need to be better maintained. Well, I let the record show Secretary Padilla, now Senator Padilla, uh, would not commit at a House administration hearing while he was Secretary of State in the last election cycle to remove identified deceased individuals off the voter rolls in California. Uh, are you aware that here in Washington, D.C., during the 2020 election, there were reports of households receiving multiple live ballots for people no longer living at that address? I'm unaware of specific cases, but that wouldn't surprise me. Do you describe this process as safe and secure? I would say that it's up to the individual to not return more than one ballot. Any conspiracies that you mentioned, conspiracy theories, any of them from the left that you can talk about? Um, constantly. There are constant conspiracy theories about uh, Russia changing votes from Hillary Clinton to Donald Trump. That never happened. Um, as I said in my testimony, conspiracy theories are a human problem. Everyone is looking for answers as to why things are the way they are. We find them in conspiracy theories. They are, and to you, some of my colleagues' comments today, debunked, baseless accusations, the Russia hoax that cost taxpayers millions of dollars, the reconnaissance tour, theory that has been debunked by our Capitol Police, who are now liars. The Hunter Biden laptop issue. This is a problem to this panel. I, I want to send this information to you. The problem is when you actually try to limit free speech, you limit the ability for truth to get out. It's not 1984. This is not Atlas Shrugged. This is an opportunity for Americans to express more free speech to deal with misinformation. Americans of all races, of all genders, no matter who you are, where you live. We have the ability to discern truth when truth is able to be presented. But when mistruths are continuing to be put to the forefront and misinformation, labeled misinformation, turns out to be true, that in turn leads to no faith in our elections. That is what we're fighting. We've got to fight the mistruths. Thank you for all your testimony today. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and I thank the ranking member for his friendship and for his questions. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes, and I suspect I will be the concluding participant here today. 
um, misinformation and disinformation are very troublesome. That's why we're having this hearing today. Uh, it's posing a, an, an imminent threat to our democracy. And the Congress of the United States has a responsibility uh, to find the facts and to find a solution. And that's what the hearing is, is about today. And I want to thank the witnesses for coming forth and giving us their perspectives. Uh, but this is, this is very serious business. Uh, I am a lawyer by training, as are others on this panel. And in law school, we were certainly taught uh, in constitutional law about how sacred the First Amendment is. And it is sacred, but it's not absolute. Uh, one of the first things we were taught in constitutional law, Ms. Scanlon, is that you cannot go into a crowded theater and haul a fire, uh, because that poses a danger to those in the theater. And, and the same thing at, at, in, in the polling place, at the ballot box. Uh, you just cannot maliciously and intentionally spread misinformation and disinformation in anticipation of the upcoming election. And so uh, we've got to continue to talk about it. Uh, my colleagues have uh, continued today to talk about Mr. Loudermilk, and, and he's a very uh, integral part of this subcommittee, and I'm sorry he's not here today. Uh, but they've talked about the innocence of, of Barry Loudermilk. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what to believe. I, I, like most Americans and millions of Americans, are watching the January 6 hearings. Uh, I call them the Thompson hearings. Uh, I've watched each one very carefully. Uh, and, and some interesting questions have arisen uh, about uh, uh, whether or not uh, Mr. Loudermilk knew or should have known that the individuals that he was giving a tour of the Capitol with, uh, that they would participate in, in a, uh, an insurrection the following day. He may not have known it uh, when, when it happened, uh, when he gave the guided tour through the Capitol. But at the very least, the very least, the Select Committee is entitled uh, to find these facts and to make a determination. And so I Mr. hope Chief, that, can I yes. Can a quick point of order? Yes. Not a sing the Capitol Police mm -hmm. wrote in a letter that there was nothing suspicious about the tour that Mr. Loudermilk gave to his constituents and friend of his constituents. Not one single person was ever charged with breaking the law and breaching the Capitol the next day. Reclaiming, re reclaiming my there. time. That is, that is baseless disinformation once again. I read the report. I read the report from the Capitol Police that Monday morning. I saw it when it came out. I read every word of it. But let me tell you, the Select Committee has vast resources at its disposal, and they have, they have access to the footage, to the camera footage, and they, they, have, they have watched the footage, and they've made some, some, they've asked some questions, and they want some answers. And, and I, I know that it may conflict uh, somewhat with the Capitol Police's determination, but their fact-finding uh, mission is, is more significant and, and, and very uh, important. And so I, I just hope that... Uh, that Mr. Loudermilk will cooperate at, at some point. But anyway, let's get on to the questions. My time is uh, almost finished. Let, let me start with you, Mr. Rothschild. Uh, in your testimony, uh, you, you write, um, and I'm going to quote it, the most fervent believers in election conspiracy theories don't see these contests as offering different visions of the economy or foreign policy, but as pitched battles between good and evil, end of quote. Uh, how does this view impact how these conspiracy theory believers view people who take a stand and push back on these lies and false claims about the legitimacy of our elections? Well, I think we have to appreciate that the people who believe these theories believe that they are fighting a war between good and evil. And you see this all the time in QAnon. This is not just a political disagreement. This is uh, God versus Satan. And you have to look at these people and understand that they, they truly believe they are divined to stop evil from winning. And I think we have to look at it in that lens, that this is not just a difference between you know, our person versus their person, this is light versus dark. And taking this as seriously as we possibly can without suppressing speech for other people, I think is where this needs to go. Thank you, and let me conclude with Mr. Cortez, if you're still on the screen, and I presume that you are. Uh, Mr. Cortez, a recent report released by the Brennan Center discussed the troubling trend of states now passing election interference laws. How has the perpetuation of disinformation, such as the lie that the last election was stolen, led to these laws and other laws that undermine access to the ballot? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's a direct connection uh, between these laws that are being promoted uh, and the lies surrounding the 2020 election. Uh, we've seen things, you know, as one example, cutbacks in uh, vote by mail, uh, in drop boxes, all, all related or premised upon 
these false claims around things that supposedly happened in the 2020 election that have never uh, been proven to be true uh, uh, around voter fraud, around, um, you know, all these just uh, sensational claims. Uh, so there is definitely a uh, connection between uh, what's going on in regards to the 2020 election lies and the efforts to uh, restrict voting for, uh, you know, in advance of this year's election and in advance of the 2024 election. Thank you. And the chairman's time has expired. Ladies and gentlemen, before we adjourn today, I, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a recently released report entitled Electoral Confusion, Contending with Structural Disinformation in Communities of Color, published by Protect Democracy. Uh, one of the co-authors and researchers on this report, Dr. Samuel Woolley, testified before this subcommittee at our April hearing on misinformation and disinformation targeted at communities of color. Without objection, uh, this document will be received. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I ask unanimous yes. consent to enter into the record a piece, uh, the letter from the Capitol Police uh, exonerating Mr. Loudermilk from any QADEM reconnaissance tour accusations? Exonerating may be a strong term, but the letter will speak for itself uh, without it objection. It was never in the Capitol, seen yeah. the video. But without objection, building. I read the letter. Exonerating is a very can strong Can I enter that term. into the record with yeah. you asking unanimous consent to do so? Unanimous consent is allowed, and as Thank we you. used to say in the courtroom, I'll take judicial notice of that letter. It, Thank you, Judge. Yes, thank you. All right, again, I want to thank the witnesses for your testimonies today and thank the members for your questions. Members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for the witnesses, and if so, we will ask you to respond to those in writing. The hearing record will be held open for those responses. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone for your participation today. Without objection, the Subcommittee on Elections now stands adjourned.